you and your family are invited to come as you are to Winning Souls Evangelistic Church. Have you been searching for a place of worship where you can be free to experience God's word in full and truth? Worship with us. Are you seeking a church home committed to serving all people of God and spreading the gospel through outreach? Fellowship with us. Would you like to discover the greatness of God's eternal love and fellowship with people from diverse backgrounds? Learn with us. If you've answered yes, come join us at Winning Souls Evangelistic Church, a non-denominational, Bible-teaching, Christ-centered place of worship. We're in the second part of our series, Change, today. Good to see you, Marla. Oh, praise team, get show Marla some love. That's, that's our wounded praise team member. But I know her, she was probably back there singing it, holding the crutch, amen. Amen, amen. If you need a Bible, slip up your hand, the ushers will give you one. Brother Mike's holding them up. <laughs> We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, 26 to 27. Ephesians chapter 4, 26 to 27. Make sure y'all just keep one another in prayer, even if you don't know the need. There are people that have been sick, that are out, and we've had some deaths uh, this week. So let's uh, just keep each other in, in prayer. I got a little brother in the house that came to worship with us today. He was on the keyboard. If y'all love what y'all hear, show my brother Chris some love in the back. Amen. 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 I'm always adopting people, but praise God for him and his ministry gift and to our music department. And we got it together. We did, did the thing, didn't we? Amen. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, 26 through 27, NIV, just these two verses. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down <clears throat> while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. One more time. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. This morning, I'm going to preach the second part of our chain series. And this message is titled, Anger Management. Right. Anger Management management. You can take your seat. They're going to get tough over the weeks, but I'm just preaching from Ephesians 4. It's right, right, in, the, right in the Bible. It's his, it's his word. Last week, we began a series called Change, and which the focus of these sermons, which are mainly coming from Ephesians 4, is to help us understand the truth of who we are in Christ. And I said it last week, and it's the reality that I'm not the same anymore. I may have some struggles. I may have some issues. I don't have it all together, but I am not the same person that I used to be before Christ. The implication for us is that because we have the nature of Christ, then we have the ability and we have the authority to walk in our new self who is being transformed into the likeness of God. Basically, there should be a difference in how we look and live now compared to how we lived and looked before we were in Christ. And the way that we continue to live a changed life, according to last week's sermon, was by putting off the old self. I told you you have to make a hard break and separate yourself from that old man, those old behaviors and that old attitude. But then I also told you that you need to renovate your mind. There's some old, nasty, ruined, broke down stuff in there that you need to take out and you need to bring in the riches of Christ Jesus, his word and prayer and meditation and reflection. And then lastly, I said that we need to clothe ourselves in the new self. We need to take on the attitudes of this new person because we're not the same anymore. So as we consider this foundation of being changed, we now look at this emotion called anger that Paul addresses in the text. Some widely accepted forms of anger include chronic anger, 
which is prolonged. It, it can impact the immune system and be the cause of other mental disorders. It, it, we're talking about a person that's just angry all the time. There's passive anger, which doesn't always come across as anger and can be difficult to identify. People experiencing passive anger may not even realize they are angry. When you experience passive anger, your emotions may be displayed as sarcasm or apathy or just meanness because you're angry all the time. There's overwhelmed anger, which is caused by life demands that are too much for an individual to cope with. Anybody ever had some overwhelmed anger? The car didn't just break down, but the cable bill was due. Your child was acting up. You got sick in your body. Something was wrong with your mother and your father. You were just overwhelmed and you got angry. There's self-inflicted anger, which is directed towards the self and may be caused by feelings of guilt. There's judgmental anger, which is directed toward others and may come with feelings of resentment. And then there's volatile anger, which involves sometimes spontaneous bouts of excessive or violent anger. Regardless of the forms, anger is a normal emotion that can range from expressing itself into a mild way to going a straight 100 when you just have rage and frustration. Normally, it's a reaction to something we perceive as a threat to ourselves, as a threat to our family, to our property, to our self-image. And notice I said, it's something that you perceive as a threat. So I can't tell you what's a threat to you. I can't tell you what's going to make you angry. Whatever you perceive as a threat to you is going to all of a sudden make you angry. Anger is a warning signal to us that something is wrong. And the discomfort and the displeasure and the fear about what we perceive is wrong causes a few different reactions or responses. When we get angry, there's a physical reaction in which our pulse starts racing and our blood pressure rises. And sometimes there's tightening in our muscles, tightening in our faces, tightening in our bodies because there's this physical reaction to anger. But then we don't just stop with that. Then our mind all of a sudden gets involved and we begin to label what we perceive is wrong. We're angry because that was unfair. That was undeserved. That was hurtful. That was unjust. That threatened me. That made me feel bad. That violated me. Our mind starts to tag those things that we perceive are wrong and make us angry. And once our mind has identified the cause of anger and we've processed it as a reason and we say that we have a right to be angry, then our behaviors begin to demonstrate at our level of anger. It may just be a look, depending on how angry you are. It may be a raised voice. Depending on sometimes it's the inability to focus. Sometimes it's saying unreasonable things and even hurtful remarks. They just spew out your mouth. It, sometimes it can result in extreme hater raid. Y'all know that one. <laughs> sometimes it could be just perspiring and sweating a lot because you're so angry. You become forceful. You slam doors. You throw things. You Anybody see anybody walk hard because they're just angry? You're just angry, angry, angry. And sometimes people get so angry, they just cry out of anger. It's not that I'm scared. It's not that they were getting on. It's not like I'm some punk and they were just getting on me. Y'all ever been there? You were just so angry. You just cried. You know you were about to knock them out, so it ain't fear. I'm just crying because I'm so angry and I feel real bad for what's about to happen. Don't let these tears. I'm just angry that I got to even go there. I'm just angry just because you violated me. That's why I'm crying. Yeah. You're crying because you're about to, and you, you know what that's going to end up in. If she look at me in church like that one more time, but she looking at you like that because she angry too. So I guess y'all just going to have an angry fight. WWE up in this piece. And see, there are so many things to make a person angry. You have to learn how to manage it or else you have anger built up on top of anger to the point that you're functioning, but in dysfunction and you become counterproductive and unhealthy. Your decision making now becomes poor because of angry relationships at home and work are now problematic. And then your health gets affected because you can't hold on to that type of aggression and not expect to have heart palpitations and fatigue. And, oh, pastor, I got tingling in my arm. That ain't a heart attack. You just angry. You need to loosen. I got headaches all the time because you got that scowl on your face because you're angry all the time. You should get a headache because you're trying to hold in the anger. 
Unaddressed anger can eat away at you and cause you to be harmful to yourself because of the decisions you make in anger. It can cause you to harm others and you can literally kill yourself. Brothers and sisters, anger must be dealt with. Now, to deal with anger, you've got to be able to understand why you're angry in the first place. (laughs) And the reality is some of us aren't even sure about the root of our anger. It's not always something current. It's not always something that just happened here and now. But there are things in our past that we've hidden from us, that we've hidden from people, that we've hidden from God that hurt us and made us feel a certain way. And even though we are whole in Christ, we're complete, we're done. We have yet to live in wholeness because we are still broken down about some family situation, some tragedy, some extreme hurt that there has been no resolve. Maybe we're angry because there was no apology. Maybe we haven't forgiven somebody. We're mad at God. Why did you allow them to do that to me when I was little? Why did you let mama die when you said that she could live and not die? We get angry. Maybe you're mad mad at God. Or maybe there's just a chapter in your life that you fail to have closure on. You're angry. So what happens is anything that happens now that triggers something that threatened us before causes anger to rise up. That's why it's good to just hug people and kiss people in church and be nice to people because you never know how your attitude sometimes will trigger some behavior or some hurt from back in the day and cause them to rise up on you in church. Church is like a hospital. So when we come in here, we're just not doing what we do for them. Your first order of service ought to be all of us in here. How you doing, brother and sister? Somebody come in here looking mad? Don't worry about how they look. Do you need anything? Because you never, never know what type of anger people are harboring in their life. So anything that threatens us or makes us feel threatened by something in the past causes anger to rise up and if we haven't learned through the power of God that we can manage it then we'll allow it to push us into behaviors that look like the person we used to be before we met Christ and I think that's the person many of us are fighting not to be but you don't have to be angry you don't have to be rotten you don't have to be ruined you don't have to be run down you don't have to be that person over anger because reasons to be angry are going to keep coming at you so you can stay like that but more is still going to come somebody's still going to tick you off something's going to happen at your job some craziness i don't know how you hurt your nieces but if that's compiled on something else that's enough to make you angry so you don't have to sit around and be ruined and rotten and run down but you can win Brothers and sisters, there is always be a reason to get angry. There's always going to be one. But Christ is the reason that we can deal with it properly. You have a choice in how anger affects you. And the beautiful thing about being a believer is that you have the Holy Spirit to help you and to empower you in your choice to overcome the negative effects of anger. Which means if you said, I'm coming out of this, you got the Holy Spirit saying, about time, I'm ready to bring you out of it too. A 2008 article in Psychology Today said that overcoming anger problems requires much more than managing the emotional feelings and psychological arousal of anger as anger management classes strive to do. Eliminating anger problems depends on the choice of what kind of person you want to be. So you overcoming anger problems is not about managing your emotions, but it's about making a choice about who you're going to be. Remember that you are new in Christ Jesus, so you already are somebody else. So if that's who you choose to live like, if that's the person you only desire to be, then be angry, but don't let your anger become you. I'm not telling you don't be angry. You need to get angry at some stuff, but don't let your anger become you. So we understand it, even though that Our anger is a natural emotion and it's real. Paul is trying to help these believers understand that as citizens of heaven, you don't deal with anger the way you would before Christ. Even in the midst of whatever makes you angry, Christ still lives in the midst of you. So you don't have to lose control or let it fill you to the point of sin. But you can manage this anger through the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, brothers and sisters, I don't care what's going on. You got this. You may think you can't handle it, but you got this. You know why? Because you've changed. You're not the same anymore. And through the spirit of God, you can handle the anger. Y'all all all right with me? 
There are three principles in the text that Paul gives us about anger management, if you will. The first one is this. There must be a decision to not let sin be the result of anger. A decision to not let sin be the result of anger. Verse 26 says, in your anger, do not sin. The words here that Paul uses are a direct quote from Psalms 4.4. Notice that he doesn't say, don't get angry. But he says you've got to get control of your anger so that it all of a sudden doesn't become sin. See, anger itself is not something that we need to pray to not have anymore. I don't want to pray to not have anger because healthy or righteous anger is good. I I'm glad that God is so angry about sin that he's going to send Jesus to down the cross to make sure that all of us can live and have life and have it more abundantly. I I I'm glad about that. I'm glad about because of the, the craziness that goes on in the world and people bombing people and killing people. I'm glad that God has such righteous anger that even though he's going to take us home they're going to have to pay for that i need him to be angry about that i needed jesus to go in the temple and all of a sudden start turning over tables and set order and say my house is a house of prayer anger can be good you need to be able to get angry about injustices in our legal system angry about mistreatment of people and oppression of certain groups and classes because that emotion will move you to action. Sometimes you need to just get angry about the fact that you're still the same place that you said you wouldn't be. You need to get angry about that and kick your own self in the behind to get moving. It's, sometimes it's good to be angry. However, the call here is to control the actions that are the fruit of anger because we can't control the onset of anger. No one knows how they're going to respond in a tragic or pro problematic situation till it happens. You can plan for it and say, I know what's going down. I know how I'm going to act. No, you don't. Not till it happens. You can't assess how angry you'll be until after you've been affected. I, 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 know, I, I know mama's sick and she's going to pass away, but I spent time with her. I'm going to be good. You thought you was going to be good until they gave you that phone call. Now you're all over the place. You're angry. You're drinking. You're cursing God. You don't know. But what you can do is once you realize anger is filling up in you, you can make a decision to not let it control you, but you control it. Right. And the way to control it is to push out the power that anger has on you from letting it settle in. Remember, there's an onset of anger, but you don't have to let it settle in and control your actions. You need to pour it, pour in God's spirit and God's word to where all that anger is trying to fill up. You need to press your way into a time of prayer and maybe praise God in advance for the victory and allow that filling of his spirit to control you so that your behaviors match up with what you believe. See, when you allow God to take control, you accept his methods over yours. So instead of being angry and sinning, if you spent time with God and allow him to fill those places and now you accept his methods over yours, if vengeance is his, then leave it in his hands. If that battle doesn't belong to you and you say it's the Lord's, let him fight the battle. If he's going to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, let God take care of that. If he's going to keep you in perfect peace, your job is to keep your mind stayed on him. Don't let the anger get to you. Let the spirit of God come in and minister to you and you accept whatever methods he's going to do in your life. I've told y'all this many times. One of my state favorite statements, you stay filled good even if you don't feel good so that your anger doesn't result in sin. You stay filled good even if you don't feel good so that your anger doesn't result in sin. Notice Paul is telling them to not sin in their anger. In other words, he's talking to them as those who actually have the power and the ability to not sin regardless of their level of anger. Oh, I'm just so angry. I've got to do something. You can still make a choice not to go do that. Don't give me that. Pray for me because I'm about to go cuss them out. Pray for me because I'm. Why do I need to pray? You already made a choice. How about you make a choice that came out of prayer and then you won't go do what you think you want to do? But don't tell me to pray for you. Make a choice. So the principle here is that anger, I don't care how bad it is, doesn't give you a license to sin. Anger isn't your excuse for doing something that's against God's word. Anger isn't some untamed emotion that has to end with actions that are ungodly. 
Anger doesn't do that, but anger can exist and not push you beyond the limitations set by God's word. You can use God's word and you can use a healthy dose of prayer and push anger out so that sin is not the issue. And this is a challenge of the changed life because we're talking about change. And it's understanding that because you are new and God has given you his characteristics, you have what you need to take control. You don't have to lose control. You have what you need to take control of your life and respond to anger in a controlled, confident, Christ-like manner. You can stand up to anger and say, I will not be defeated. I will not be ruined. I'm not going to lose my job over this. I'm not going to lose my family over this or my kids. I shall not be moved. You got the power in you to be able to do that. Your friend talking to you can't do it. The psychologist can't do that for you. Medications can't do that for you. You got to get in the presence of God and say, this ain't going down. Like, I will not be wrecked because of anger. Anger does not have to take over you. Because if Jesus got up from the dead and you rose with him, that tells me you over the anger that he conquered. Oh, oh, yeah. You're over it. You don't have to let it be over you. But you need to realize that you're over it and then you need to get over it and let God in so he can do what he needs to do. Make a decision to not let sin be the result of your anger. But there's another principle here that Paul displays in the text. There must also be a a determination to quickly let go of anger. It's not just not letting sin be the result of your anger, but there's a determination to quickly let go of anger. He says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Paul says, regardless of what makes you angry, your feeling of anger can't last into the night. It can't go into the next day. Anger must be dealt with as quickly as possible. William Barclay comments on this, and he says, Plutarch tells us that the disciples of Pythagoras had a rule of their society that if during the day, Anger had made them speak insulting to each other. Before the sun set, they shook hands and kissed each other, and they were reconciled. See, anger may have some initial reactions, but amends can still be made quickly. I know it hurt. That thing was fire. It stuck you. It was bad. But amends can still be made quickly so that those initial emotions don't carry over into the next day. Sometimes they carry over into weeks. And then you look back. How come this year was the same as last year? Because that anger just went over into year after year after year. See, the quicker you seek to mend the offense, you are in a frame of mind to deal with it more rationally. But the longer you wait, the less likely you are to address it favorably. And sometimes you never address it and you become more bitter because the anger just starts to metastasize in you. If you're married or in a relationship or friendship, If you've been wrong to the point of anger and don't attempt to deal with it quickly, it will keep dealing with you. Imagine if it's your your husband or your wife. You have to wake up every day saying good morning, knowing that you're angry. If it's your child, wake up every day knowing that you're angry. If it's somebody at your job, it's your best friend. You're high-fiving, you're seeing them, but the whole time you're angry. Ultimately, you make the person you're in a relationship with pay for it over time because you've never reconciled. But you also pay the price of not reconciling because that anger is affecting your quality of life. You you know why forgiveness is so important? When you don't forgive somebody, they sucking their thumb, sleeping, they ain't ain't, ain't got a care in the world. You, You the one at home like you in a cage like a monkey. You don't know what to do. You got all this rage. They ain't thinking about you. The reason why you want to forgive them is not for them. It's for you. You the one stand up all night. Every time you see him, you get mad. When you roll up to the parking lot, you wait for them to go in church because you don't want to go in at the same time as them. You the only one mad. You got to use the bathroom, but you're going to hold it. I ain't going around there because they over there affecting your quality of life because you want to be angry. Don't let nobody have that power of you. We up here casting out demons and we ought to be casting you out because you letting people run your life over anger. You don't want to forgive. Some of us even now live bitter lives because we fail to reconcile with someone, something or even reconcile with ourselves. And the reality is many people get used to living bitter and they don't even realize that they are. They walk around bitter. 
They sit in bitterness. They have relationships in bitterness. They drive to work bitter. They're sitting inside of work bitter. They come home bitter. You raise your kids bitter. You appear serving in church bitter. You pray bitter. You read the Bible bitter. You don't even realize it. Because of, it's tight, but it's right. Because of anger. And you, you think you, bitterness had become your new normal. Which means even if you got right, that may, you might be scared of being right because you've been bitter for so long. Isn't that crazy? It's a life in which you've pulled the shades down and live in the dark. With the sun shining on the other side. Nothing but darkness. But see, Jesus transferred us from the kingdom of darkness. So why should we live in a place that we've been lifted from? Why should we let anger feed on us and fester in us so that we live in the darkness of sin while the blessings of the sun are on the other side? Watch this of a decision to let it go. The blessings are on the other side of a decision to let it go. Most of our anger, when we hold it, becomes sin. Sin sets up a wall where God can't get to us when he's trying to get to us. So while you're sitting in darkness and sitting in anger, the whole time you're not making that decision to let it go. There are blessings on the other side of your decision waiting for you. And if you want to tear down that stronghold, all you got to say, I apologize. I forgive. I'm not taking it no more. I'm releasing it from my life. You've been messing up your life. Everything you proclaim from year to year never going to happen because it's on the other side of a decision to let it go. So the day you decide to let it go, I got to forgive today. I got to stop holding. Expect the blessings of God to come your way. But he ain't going to be fooling with that sin. And I'm not just talking about what you do and what you say. I'm talking about what you think before you even do it. That's setting up a wall too. Preach, Pastor Edwards. You, you, you might, you might want to release that if you're trying to get all that God has for y'all all right with this. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss what God has for me because I'm messed up off of what somebody did to me. And can I tell you this? People are always going to do something to you. So if you can't take one person or two people, I hate to say it like this, you might as well just go to heaven now because it ain't going to get no better. I mean, just be like Stephen in the New Testament, like, just take me, Lord. Just forgive them of their sins and just take me, Lord. Somebody always going to mess with you. But you're going to have your life be all messed up because they keep coming against me. They keep saying stuff. They keep doing stuff. Whether it's in your household or outside, it's always going to happen. I don't want to prolong my destiny because I'm so damaged, but what I wouldn't let go and who I wouldn't forgive. Messing up your destiny. And now you get too weak to go forward. Too tired to really get up and go. Too crazy to plan for your future because all that stuff you're angry about. Imagine this. You can't even plan for your future because anger has infiltrated in your mind. You're all messed up. You don't know what you want to do. How you want to spend your money, how you want to raise your kids, you and you and your husband or your wife, y'all can't even go forward because your mind's so messed up by anger. Yeah. Baby, we ain't gone nowhere in a while. <laughs> we ain't been on a vacation in a while. <laughs> we ain't kissed in a while just because your life messed up because of anger. I'm preaching the truth. Too angry to speak life to your situation because angry people don't speak life. Everything they see is just bad. It's wrong. I know how this is going to turn out. They don't like me. I don't like them. That's how angry people talk. Nothing positive. Brothers and sisters, we've got to let go of anger quickly. Because as those that have been changed, we risk the chance of living like the old us. And who we were doesn't benefit who we are and who we're trying to become. Brothers and sisters, we've got to let it go. But lastly, Paul shows us something else. There's a danger in living with anger. Verse 27, and do not give the devil a foothold. That, that's, that's, that's the danger. See, it was just you dealing with it, but now you done tag team somebody else into it. And I don't know about you all. I can mess my own life up. I don't need the devil to come in. <laughs> that, that's just worse. Lastly, Paul identifies a problem that can arise when anger isn't dealt with. When we don't deal with anger, it leads to bigger problems. Anytime there's a breach or some opening that doesn't get repaired quickly, then there's always an opportunity for something external to come in and make matters worse. I told you all this story a, a long time ago when me and my wife were living in New Jersey. We, uh, 
we had a little hole up, up in our roof on the side of the house. It was, just, it was just a small hole. And I don't know if you know how squirrels operate. All, all squirrels need is a small hole. They don't have to have a big hole where they can just walk right up in. All they need is a small hole. I'm sure we saw it, looked up there. We first time homeowners, we, we ain't know nothing about it. Before long, we'd be sleeping right over our head. When I say good morning to her, they saying good morning to us. It was just one, it's just like one happy family. But they took the opportunity because they saw the hole. And they made what was a small hole bigger. And then they got in and made a home in my house. And now that they've made a home in my house, they started taking liberties. I'm going to use the bathroom here. I'm going to go down on, in, in the walls. I'm going to eat up some wires and stuff. I'm going to run around when they don't want me to run around. They took liberties and started wreaking. Built a whole big nest in there. All because the hole was left open. Now imagine your life. Because you got anger and you don't want to mend stuff and you don't want to close the breach. It may be a small thing. I ain't really that mad about it. You better be true to yourself. Because the enemy would come in and make that a big thing. And then he'll start taking liberties into your life. Pulling back some old crazy stuff that wasn't even an issue. Because he wants you to be angry and sin. So it's not just what you're thinking about now. He'll go grab some crazy stuff and say, I'm going to get them to ruin their life. And he'll add this on and add this on. He'll set up shop right inside your spirit. All because you gave him a foothold. I want to be free. I want to be delivered. You better work on men mending some stuff. The devil has a place now to set up shop and work evil. And he does it when fractured relationships aren't mended. That's a hole. When we leave a gap because we're holding on to a grudge and don't want to forgive. That's a hole. When we have an argument and we don't apologize. That's a hole. We don't realize it. But now it's not just us when anger is present. But we've invited the enemy in. And sometimes he's done major damage before we can finally run him out. I don't know what them squirrels did, but by the time we ran them out, they did what they needed to do up there. By the time you really grab hold of it, he have messed up your life. We don't realize it. So now if Paul is talking to the church and one of the themes is unity, imagine how this affects unity in the body. What if there are multiple people holding on to anger and it's causing cracks in the foundation? Mm. Then you wind up with a church in which the enemy is given too many opportunities to kill, steal, and destroy. Because for every unforgiveness, every no apology, every fractured relationship, there's a hole. And just imagine the enemy all over the church wreaking havoc. That's good. Because we didn't want to seal up the cracks in the foundation. Then you wind up with the church where the enemy just runs rampant. But see, it's not going to kill the church because Jesus says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. So the church isn't going anywhere. But you wind up with a church full of hell, which doesn't have to become, which doesn't have to be this way when we have the power to get the hell out of the church. If this is supposed to be the place of peace and the place of healing, then we should be doing all that we can to protect it. You know how we protect it? I'm sorry, my brother and sister. You know what? The Bible talks about I got an ought against them. I need to go straight to them first and not to everybody else because if I go to everybody else, it's going to mess up this relationship anymore. You know what? I'm harboring something. I need to go forgive. Come on, That's how we protect. We protect it and we ensure that the devil has no opportunities. We got to cut it out so that we can cut him off immediately. If you're going to be angry, be angry about the fact that the devil has been running more of your new life than you have. That, that, if you're going to be angry, be, be angry about that. Be angry about the fact that when life was good, all you could do was see bad and you made it bad because you wouldn't mend a relationship. Be angry about that. Be angry about the fact that it's 2016 and you're five or ten years behind where you should be in life all because you didn't choose to deal with your angry anger. Be angry about that. Get angry enough to bust a move in your spirit and tell the devil he has no place in your life. 
He has no place in your home. He has no place on your job. He has no place in your ministry. He has no place in your marriage. Devil, you ain't got no place in my destiny. I will get to where God wants me to be, and you have no place here. If you're going to get angry, get angry about that. Tell the devil he has to leave because God has shown you through his word how to manage this anger. You will smile again. You will be healthy again. Brothers and sisters, anger can no longer run and ruin our lives. It can no longer destroy us, mess us up, mess up what God's trying to do. Through the spirit of God, we must manage our anger. I didn't say by yourself, through the spirit of God, we must manage our anger. Make a decision that I will be angry sometimes, but I'm not going to let it result in sin. And then you got to be determined that if I'm angry, I got to fix this thing quickly. The sun can't go down on my anger. And then there is that bit of caution. Watch out for the enemy trying to get a foothold in your life. There's already other areas in your life where you're going to have holes where the enemy's going to try to get in. But don't let it be just because of an emotion, something like anger, just because you don't want to control it. Vengeance is mine. I got to do something about it. You're going to hurt somebody else, but you're going to be hurting the end too. Because the enemy is sure enough going to bust a move on you. That's his delight. Anger. Management. We got to deal with it, brothers and sisters. All heads bowed and eyes closed. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this changed life. We thank you that we don't have to be affected by what used to affect us. We don't have to make the old decisions. Winning Souls Evangelistic Church is one of the area's most dynamic churches, touching the lives of hundreds of people in Pasadena and the surrounding communities. We are a community full of energy, faith, and most importantly, people who want to serve God and one another. We're dedicated to being a place where you can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Winning Souls Evangelistic Church is committed to being a loving, healing fellowship where you can discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ. Newcomers are extended a most cordial invitation to worship and unite with us. We extend an invitation for all to come and join us this Sunday at 10 a.m. for an anointed, powerful, and uplifting worship of God. Give us a call today for more information or visit us online.